Uh, you know, I thought I never, ever, ever had to watch that arc again. But because obviously my uh, fairy tale arc reviews and my rewatch of the anime of the fairy tale, I have to rewatch that specific arc. And uh, yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about this arc. Yes. <sighs> Clearly, you see that I don't want to be here today. But hey, I got to talk about the arcs that I love as much as I have to talk about the arcs that I just don't like. And it's very few in fairy tale, but these are one of the few. Now, other than the Daphne arc, which I didn't cover because it was fucking terrible, and little portions of the Alvarez Empire arc. This arc probably is my least favorite arc. And we are talking about the Eclipse Celestial Spirits arc. Whoop do doodle do. I knew reviewing the movie first was going to make me feel much better than reviewing this first. Anyways. So let, let's get into it. So the Eclipse Celestial Spirits arc. It's an anime only arc, so it's not in the canon of fairy tale. So I guess that's good. You don't you don't have to witness this in the manga. Now the premise behind the fairy behind the Eclipse Celestial Spirits arc is the fact that, well, let me just say this. It was a good idea, a good concept. It just wasn't executed good. Essentially, Lucy's and Yukino's celestial spirits from the Zodiacs all go bad. Like I said, good idea, good premise. Hey, what would happen if uh, Lucy's celestial spirits went evil on her? And they have to find some way to turn them back and, uh, you know, get them to how they used to be. And I also like the fact that they brought in a how they how they brought in a canon arc to uh, make sense of why they went bad. We find out later in this arc that, oh, it's because the them closing and opening the Eclipse Gate essentially turned them bad. Makes sense. Makes sense. Because look at it, the Eclipse Gate, that was a product of the Book of Zareth. Something that has ties to the Book of Zareth. Zareth, black magic, dark magic. Makes, would make sense why, how dark magic would affect the celestial spirits. Makes sense, which goes to show you that this gate should never have been open in the first place, first place, and why this gate doesn't need to be open in the first place. So I like that aspect. I do. I really do. But everything else in this arc is complete sucks. There's only like a few things here and there that I kind of like. The idea... The fact that they brought in the Eclipse Gate to explain why this, and then probably just moments, which are like only two, and that's the uh, Levy game show confession thing, which we don't hear, but we know she likes Dajil. And then two, the funny gray dancing like he's Michael Jackson. Now, it is still a questionable scene because you got this man touching a gay crab up in places that I wouldn't want another man touching me. I'll tell you that. But other than that, seeing, seeing great dance was freaking hilarious. That actually got a laugh out of me. Most of everything else that was probably played for comedic relief didn't much get a laugh out of me. If they did, they got a little chuckle. Other than that, nothing. Now, in my first arc review of this, I trashed it. You can't see it because I privated the video anyways. So, too bad, so sad. And just like that video, I'm going to trash this arc too. This is not one of my favorite fairy tale arcs. Not. Not, not, not. And for the love of God, thank God it's short. So, this arc covers anime episodes 204 to 226. 
Again, this covers right after the Grand Magic Games arc is done. Um, and it's kind of like the fill-in before you get to the hecticness of what is the Tartarus arc. That's what I feel like this arc is here for. This is why this arc is kind of placed in for. It's just a nice little kind of placement where you get like the stage of a beginning, of like the first few arcs of fairy tale type of thing here. And uh, it's a little nice little icebreaker after coming off the craziness and the hecticness in, at the end of the Grand Magic Games arc, and especially before you get to the craziness and hecticness of the Tartarus arc. This is what this arc is here for, to give you some nice little fillery stuff and funs and laughs and have stuff before we get into the serious, nonchalant, no cutting BS no more type of fairy tale stuff going on here. Now, fun fact, I just read off the episodes from 204 to 226. Technically, this arc goes from episode 204 to 218, I believe. 218 or 219, I believe. That's how long, truly, the storyline of this Eclipse Celestial Spirits arc it is. The remaining episodes in this arc are just filler episodes where you get your kicks and your giggles and your nice moments. Like I said, before you get to the hecticness, the freaking craziness, and damn near high stakes Tartaros arc, which I cannot wait to talk about. That video is going to be coming out in two weeks from now. Because next arc review, I'm going to be talking about the Sun Village arc, which is a soft intro to the Tartaros arc. Anyways, anyways, anyways. Let's get on to the start of talking about the story points of this arc. And I'll tell you the flaws that I have with this. Again, if you like this arc, hey, more power to you. I'm not going to hate on you if you like the arc. You got enjoyment where I didn't find any, any enjoyment. Personally, I found this arc flat out boring, flat out stupid, and flat out just flat out terrible. Other than that, let's get to it. So really, the arc starts off in a way where Lucy and Yukino, they are essentially letting the spirits do whatever they want. They just ask them, hey, what do you want? We'll see if we can grant your wish like we're some sort of genie out here. Um, and you see the various celestial spirits come out and ask for things. Um, Ares asks for a tan. Um, Tauros, he comes out. He's like, oh, I want you, Lucy. I'm like, yeah, you probably should have not brought him out because we all know what Tauros wants from Lucy. He, he wants the vitamin P. I don't know if uh, Amp... Uh, a freaking talking cow on two legs should do that because that's bestiality, but I digress. He can have his own fantasies. Uh, we had Gemini transform into Luffy, Lucy in a freaking in, in the same towel get up where she's essentially in the nude as Lucy, and she's just saying pee, pee, or whatever it says in a dancing format. Virgo, the probably the one that got the, mo the most laugh out of me is probably Virgo. From the standpoint, she just wants to be punished. And that's just been her ongoing stick the entire series, is that she wants Lucy to punish her. And all Lucy does is, we're thinking we're going to get some sort of bondage scene where, she, you know, freaking Lucy's whipping her and everything and freaking abusing her. No, you can't really do that on kids' television, because I envision at this time, this came out at a time zone when it's like... uh very, uh, I guess, appropriate for kids to watch, even though at this portion of the game, they have fucking fan service out of the ass. And I'll tell you this. I'll say, I'll, I'll get to it later, but there's one of the few arcs where I think they did the fan service too much. I know. This portion of the story, they do a lot of fan service, but my God, the fan service stuff they do in here. I love my fan service, but sometimes it was definitely unnecessary. So I'll get to those fan service moments, but... Well, but the Virgo moment did get a nice little laugh out of me. I will say that. I kind of laughed my ass off. Because she's thinking she's going to get tortured and punished by Lucy. But no, Lucy just kind of flicks her on the forehead. And she's like, oh, this was the greatest punishment ever. And I was over here dying because just a flick on the forehead was the greatest thing she could have did. Yeah, funny. Uh, you would think Loki would come out and ask for like some Mike wishes, like a date or something like that. No. He's just, I guess you, well, he tries to freaking go out with Yukino, and then Lucy puts him back and 
back into the spirit world because he's like, I think uh, you got your gift seeing Yukino. Listen, who wouldn't want to see Yukino? She's hot. Listen, I would take her out on a date, but then again, she's Sting girl, so I don't want to take Sting's girl from her. Um, which is funny because before this arc, they had a few filler episodes, like one of them looking for Froche. And literally, Rogue grabbed freaking Yukino's boob. And obviously, Sting took offense to that because that's his woman. Um, so, yeah. Um, Capricorn, he freaking like just. What is it? Said some poem uh, pieces. Eight happy, literally. Libra, uh, or li yeah, Libram, um, literally freaking did the force push on everybody and made them smash the ground. Cancer made everybody get a haircut and stuff, or made Happy get a haircut uh, and stuff like that. But yeah, that's kind of it. Um, probably the most endearing one was probably Aquarius. Aquarius comes out in kind of a pissy attitude. And uh, essentially, the thing is, um, she's like, make me laugh. But essentially, Lucy tries to fake a play. She gets into trouble. Uh, Aquarius saves her. And we kind of get a nice little moment between um, her, Lucy, and Aquarius from the standpoint where Aquarius is rem remembering back when Lucy was a child. And I guess you can say Lucy got on her last damn nerves and stuff like that. But it was nice moments to solidify the backstory between her and Lucy and the relationship and what it's like. And we know Aquarius has been a tough character on Lucy, but at the end of the day, in the deepest, darkest parts of her heart, she has always cared about Lucy. Now, um, the one thing I do like about this is the fact that even at the end of this horrible arc, they give another Aquarius slash Lucy moment here from the standpoint of, I saw what they did here because they know, oh, if you're going to see the Tartarus arc and you watch the Tartarus arc, you know what's going to happen to Aquarius in that arc. So we're just going to make you uh, get a little bit more emotional and feel for these, have these feel good moments. And by the time the moment in the in the freaking Tartarus arc happens, you're bawling your damn eyes out. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of the thing there. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah. I like that moment, but yeah. So uh, let's get to the really the main portion. So that's kind of the start of the arc. So, re the, so really the next part of the arc is the fact that the weather in Fiore is all sort of out of whack and weird. Like you have freaking snow happening in deserts, you know, in snowy places, it's a freaking burning hot. Essentially you'd see weird ass weather in a type of way that's completely opposite of the area's climate. So two, we also see Lucy come in and she gets a request to do a job that's only given for a celestial spirit. And the only celestial spirits in today's age we know are Lucy and Yukino. So, yeah. Anyways, what happens is they go to this beach area and end up fighting a sea slug. But the one thing is Lucy tries to call it her um, spirits using her keys, but... Uh, her keys aren't working, and the spirits are not coming out. Now, at the same time, Yukino also drops by the guild hall, guild hall at Fairy Tale to talk to everyone and say, I need to talk to Lucy about something. And it's the fact that her keys aren't responding as well. Eventually, when the eventually the Fairy Tale members find out, well, uh, oh, Lucy took a fake job. So we find out it's a fake job and stuff like that. Now, the thing is. After the whole sea slug incident, after they took that down, Lucy calls Grandpa Crux, and, hey, he was able to come. And he, we find out he's injured and everything. And Lucy's trying to ask what's happening and everything, and Grandpa Crux is like, you need to get out of here. But then we see he's gotten captured by none other than Virgo, who looks very different. Um, and she has a different look. She has She's not wearing her maid clothes. She's wearing, like, a leather jacket and stuff like that, and now she has a whip. Um, and then all of a sudden, she starts to attack Lucy, and they fight and everything. Eventually, it gets to the point where the remaining spirits Lucy has um, come out, her Zodiac spirits come out, and they all have different looks, um, very unique in their own way. So I do like the appreciate. I do appreciate the fact that they didn't keep their design similar 
um, are their regular designs are just bad. It's literally different designs. And uh, well, hey, they it shows the changes. Now, some of them look pretty menacing, like Virgo and Leo. Um, others, like Aquarius and freaking Gemini, eh, could have been better. I'll say that, but okay. Um, they go on to say that they're not her slave and that they've broken their contracts with her and that they're going to uh, achieve true freedom. I wish I could achieve true freedom from watching this damn arc again. That would help. So, yeah. Anyways, when they get back to fairy tale, they bring up, they tell you, you know, oh, this is what happened and stuff like that. And they're wondering how can they fix all this stuff. Now, when they call Crux out again, including Hor Horologium, I believe, they find out that they need to find this item, um, this item called the Librum, and it's like in the form of celestial globe, like a globe, like you see the globe of the Earth or something like that. And the thing is, the Eclipse Celestial Spirits need that Librum to be able to start the ritual to achieve true freedom. So... That's when uh, we see something from the last filler arc, which was the Magic Library, you know, when they went back over there and Urzo, Kana, and Wendy went into, ran into the Butt Jiggle gang there. You remember. So I like that they tie in the filler arc's location, so I guess that's pretty cool, I guess you can say. But they all split up into different teams. Natsu was supposed to go with the team of Levi, Lucy, and Yukino to the Magic Library to look for information, but... He hitches a ride on hor 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 Horologium to go to the Celestial Spirit World, um, and he ends up fighting Tauros, and he ends up getting waxed. Yeah, he ends up getting waxed, pretty simply. And don't worry, we'll talk about how Tauros fucking lost later in this arc. Now, Levi, Yukino, and Lucy go to the Magic Library to find clues, but Virgo interrupts that whole stuff. Um... I guess you can say I kind of like Virgo's powers in her Eclipse Celestial Spirits form. Like, she can legit, instead of, like, a regular form, just dig holes. She can just make holes out of just, I guess, how whenever she wants to make the hole and stuff like that. Um, also, too, um, essentially with Virgo, which, honestly, I kind of find funny. Again, Virgo makes me laugh um, in this. Her Eclipse Celestial Spirit form makes me laugh. Essentially, Virgo, I like, we all know, likes punishment, but Virgo essentially is a massive kiss for dishing out the punishment herself. She likes to dish it out, and she takes pleasure in it, um, which is very funny, and it's still fitting of her character. It's just the complete opposite. Her regular self would love to have the punishment happen to her, so she would like to get pain. Man, this girl would definitely like to take it up, you know, the butt, I guess you can say. And she would probably call that punishment if you were slapping her butt. I'm going to keep it PG right then and there. If you know what I'm talking about, hey, keep it to yourself. But uh, here, she likes to dish it out. Um, so she essentially gets in her way and everything. Eventually, after long running scenes, after run longing, run long, run long, long, longing scenes, she freaking finally catches up. And they, when they find the globe, she ends up taking it. And Natsu finally comes back in from the Celestial Spirits world. I need to turn off my notifications. And uh, she goes away. Essentially saying, essentially waiting for them to find the globe, doing their own bidding for them. Um, and then Levy says, essentially, great timing. She eventually finds out that uh, when they activate the ritual, the spirits in 12 days will die. So... To achieve true freedom, they're going to die. I don't know what they call that freedom. That sounds very stupid. If you wanted to achieve freedom, why do you want to kill yourself? Oh, wait, don't worry. Because when, trust me, it's so stupid when they, when, you, when they tell the characters, the spirits like, oh, you got 12 days to live. Why would you freaking want to do this? Live 12 days and then die. They're like, it don't matter. We're getting our freedom, and that's all that matters. And I'm like, but you're dying. That's not freedom. That's death. 
And I believe by that chance, you have no option of freedom. You don't get to choose where to go to heaven or hell. If that was the case, everybody would be wanting to go to heaven. No one want to go to hell. So whatever, uh, they're going to risk their entire, they're going to waste 12 days of their life to achieve freedom. Anyways, uh, Natsu's group actually runs up into uh, runs into Princess Hisui and Arcadios again. So I like the fact I, I like the uh, fact that they bring these two characters back, even though in the Grand Magic Games arc you can save without a matter. Well, even though Arcadios was kind of in somewhat of an important character in that arc, and Hisui just showed up at the last second because hey, let's introduce the fact that the kingdom's got a princess. And she was lied to by Future Rogue. Um, in this arc, they're kind of there. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Do I like the fact that they're that their presence is clearly here? Yes, but they don't do anything. They're just there. Arcadius is the thing that kind of just tells Hisui, "Hey, stay there, princess. Hey, stay there, princess." And Hisui is kind of just the same character she's been where she's like no i want to stay here till i see the end of it um and everything anyways um he's to win arcadio stone the place where they need to look for to find the spirits is the called the astral spiritist also he says the reason why the spirits are acting different is because of the eclipse gate and you know it has an effect on them like i said at the start the eclipse them opening and closing the eclipse gate you know, and the fact that it has ties to the Book of Zare clearly affected them, and it had a very good effect on them because they're all, well, bad guys now. Um, and we actually find some um, actually pretty interesting. Also, they also do say, I forgot to mention too, they also do say the reason why the we weather is all weird and everything is because when you open the, the Eclipse Gate, after you open and close it, Weather gets affected, weather patterns get affected by it. So, so great, this very ancient thing actually affects the weather. Why the fuck did you open it in the first place then? Oh, wait, that's right. I can't. I, I just remembered. I just remembered. They had to, they all thought the dragons wouldn't come and they all foolishly were fooled by future rogues and the eclipse cannon and stuff like that. So, I guess I can't really blame them for opening the gate, but. Still, if you know the detriments to it, why'd you open it? But then again, like I said, they were completely wrong. They thought the dragons were going to show up from the eye, from the sky and everything. But hey, now, um, essentially, we find out he so he says we can stop the spirits by using these special keys that will be able to close their gates. Now, our characters bring them a good point. They're like, how the hell do you know that? How, how do you how do you build these keys? The only way you can build a key is of the fact that you're a celestial wizard. And we find out some very, pretty interesting lore, back, background information about Hisui, Princess Hisui, is the fact that, well, Princess Hisui is like a celestial wizard too. She's like one of the last remaining ones in those in the fairy tale world, because in the fairy tale world, like they make it known like there's barely any celestial wizards to be like around, like, if not many. We haven't seen a lot. They always hint at the fact that there's like not enough celestial wizards. Um, so I guess from that standpoint, it's cool to find that out. The fact is, does she do anything? No. She's a celestial wizard and she doesn't do anything. Hell, she doesn't even have silver keys. It would have been nice to know, oh, she's a celestial wizard. And the way you could get her to participate in this arc is the fact that, oh, how about we just give her some silver keys? Because we see in Yukino's case, she has some silver keys that actually are pretty combat heavy um silver keys so why not have given that to the princess also too i know probably at the time or um not horkoshi um mashima didn't think of princess hisui at the time but it could have been nice if maybe they didn't give lucy as many zodiac keys and they had maybe hisui have at least one of the zodiac keys that would have made sense because by the time you introduce you can on give you give her the last two uh that's it so maybe they could have also given the prince, Princess Hisui, uh, or Ficus, because you can all have that and stuff like that, but whatever. Um, so, okay, good information and stuff like that, but uh, yeah. Um, anyways, listen, she's about to say one more thing, too, 
but then pieces attacks the eclipse celestial spirit uh, the eclipse celestial spirit version of pieces attacks you get a back and forth fight with him and Natsu, the boy version, stuff like that. They do the old typical bait and switch where, oh, you think the heroes got their keys back after they were first stolen, only for their keys to be stolen again. Why didn't these, why didn't pieces just steal the keys and say, we're out of 5,000, goodbye, but we're going to go achieve our true freedom? Why did they have to go fight? Oh, brother. Anyways. Then they pull the whole card where okay, it's like, oh, those keys are fake. Here's the real one. So in other words, we wasted everything for nothing. You could have cut down none of that battle, and you could have just said, hey, don't worry about it. We got the they took they took the fake, they took fake ones. We have the real ones. I would have been fine. Saves more time. Probably saves more episode time to get this arc faster done. Oh, brother. Uh, uh anyways. Um, he he says in order to close their gates with the keys, they essentially have to like make them knock out into submission. That's it. So yeah. Anyway, she also says she also knows the location of the astral spiritist. Oh boy, would have that been nice to know? Say, oh, the place where they're looking for is the astral spiritist, and I know how to get there. <sighs> I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Let's go on to the next story point. Anyways, we see the Eclipse Spirits, Leo, Loki, whatever you want to call them, try to do the ritual, but they eventually all stop him, and eventually all the other fairy tale members show up. The other, you know, ones that show up are Erza, Grey, um, yeah, Erza, Grey, Wendy, Mira Jane, Elfman, Gajil, Lily, and Levy. So, intriguing to say the least, but hey. Okay. Oh, and Kana. I totally forgot Kana. Uh, yeah. So, um, and what ends up happening is the fact that each of the eclipse, you know, spirits goes into their, it goes into their different world gates or something like that, and you have these t battles where characters are pit up against one character and stuff like that. So, yeah. So Elfman he fights Tauros, and you'll never know how he defeated Tauros. Let me take a sip of my uh, cranberry juice. You know, before I lose my cool. Elfman defeats Tauros by using his own sweat. Really? Really? People get on this show for fairy tale using the power of friendship, but they don't want to critique the same show for one battle where a dude wins because of his own sweat. What the hell was that? This is what I'm talking about. Boring stuff I don't care. That would probably be one of the stupidest ways to win a battle I've seen in anime, period. I don't care if it's filler. Sweat? That's like telling Goku to defeat Frieza, and guess what? His, his Super Saiyan sweat is so strong, it knocks Frieza away. Oh, brother. Natsu fight gets in a fight with Loki. But he ends up being transported to the Aquarius world with Wendy. In the meantime, Wendy's playing freaking tag your it in a way, avoiding her, being, avoiding Kit Aquarius' attacks, as well as eating fucking ice cream and enjoying fun times. They end up getting on a Ferris wheel. Carla gets stuck in the Ferris wheel thing. Eventually, Natsu shows up. They end up having Aquarius damages or destroys the Ferris wheel so damn badly she falls. Wendy saves her, and then guess what? 
just closes her date just like that. Because she's like, oh, let's play again next time. I don't think Aquarius is going to be playing again with you, Wendy. Because it's not going to be little kid Aquarius. Boring. Don't care. I guess one of the few ones that somewhat intrigued me was the Levy contest game, the game show one, where she's pitted up against Capricorn. And, uh, well, guess what? She has to ask, she has to answer, like, these very, these, these questions about, you know, fairy tale that actually would throw you for a loop. Like, one of the first questions is like, oh, who was the doll freaking Lucy had when she was a child? And Levy, we would all think, oh, it's Michelle. That's what it is. And it's like, eh, eh, you're wrong. And it was a completely different name before Lucy ever named it Michelle. And I was like, oh, shit. You know, the one, another good question that actually probably nobody would probably guess, even if you're a fairy tale lunatic, unless, you, well, if you love fairy tale, you would think, oh, you know, the guy who doesn't take requests, what's his last name? You wouldn't even think about that because he's irrelevant. So I actually thought, I actually liked that. I liked the ending to it or the fact that, you know, it, it was funny because the game show host was like, so who does Levy like in her guild? Because she likes somebody in her guild romantically. And, he, and I also liked how the way they described how Levy likes. Obviously, it's God Shield. Like, the game show host is like, oh, and when we talk about like, we're talking about the person she yearns for night and day. And I'm hearing this. I'm like, wait, night and day? I'm like, what does she do? I'm like, like, like literally, especially if you watch the dub version. Then the dub version, they make it seem like Levy does, uh, well, Levy touches herself and does sexual things to herself to, uh, I guess, uh, I, I, I guess you can say turn herself on when she's thinking about Gaj on the moment. Listen, everybody's done it at least one point in their life. But, um... Yeah, that's what I took out of it. The dub makes it funny. Like, she literally gets off just thinking about Gajil, and she's sexually doing stuff to herself. Um, again, keeping it PG the best I can. Um, so, yeah. Um, and the fact that they don't say, Levy says it, um, but the anime is very, very, uh, you know, so you're smart. You just don't want to give out who Levy likes in a filler arc. So they kept that hidden. But, Nine out of ten times, I think we all know that it's definitely Gajil. Um, so she ends up defeating Capricorn, which Capricorn is like, I never thought you would have answered that question. Um, so yeah, and two, mind you, this is where they were literally falling into a pit with saws. I guess from this case, I liked it fine. It was fun. It was it, it is what it is. Honestly, I, it got a kick out of me. The only thing I enjoyed about this Levy game show contest thing against Capricorn was the whole fact that she admitted who she liked. Although we don't hear it, she admitted it. So, yeah, she admitted that she that she's in love with Gajil. Um, which, again, like I said, golly, my favorite ship, and personally, I think best ship of fairy tale. That's my opinion, but not yours. If it's not yours, it's fine. But I think it's the best ship in fairy tale because, hey, we all I only care about golly up in here. Um, so, yeah, uh, Kana is playing a card game with Scorpio. Yeah, he's playing, like, some sort of Bakugan X Yu-Gi-Oh hybrid type of shit. Essentially, the premise of the game is they can do whatever they freely want. That's what I got out of it. They can call whatever type of cards they want and have any types of difference, you know, type of abilities and set like that and everything. So that's funny. Uh, you get a fused character between Natsu and Happy. So, hey, that's funny. Uh, Gildarts, she pulls out Gildarts, and Gildarts is like the car that you just can't defeat because Gildarts is broken. So I guess I forgot to mention, Gildarts appears in another arc, even though it's in a, I freaking, I guess you can say a cameo here. There's the other arc he appears in, which I totally forgot. Um, so so no, Kana wins. Mary Jane is finding pieces, easily defeats pieces. Easily. So, yeah. Uh, Gray. Oh, brother. Probably my favorite one out of everything was the fact that we have Michael Jackson dancing Gray. Michael Jackson Gray. Now, I don't like the stuff after it where he's literally dancing, holding 
cancer and gay poses and everything and touching him in areas that another man should not be touching me. Let's get something straight. I'm only into females, not males. I'll be a good, I'll, I'll be your friend if you're a dude, but uh-uh, uh-uh. I want boobs and booty from a female. I don't need dude. But seeing Gray dance like he's Michael Jackson, I swear, was funny. And hell, in the dub, I don't know if they do this in the sub, but in the dub, the, the, the English dub voice actor for Gray literally changes the tone of how he talks as Gray when he's in this whole different Gray persona. Funny. Just hilarious. Hilarious. That actually got a crying out laughter from me. And that's the one thing I laughed out loud for. Other than that, don't care. Don't care about anything else. Uh, speaking of uh, Gray, his lover, Juvia, um, ends up fighting Ares in a desert. When she gets water, she ends up beating Ares. Kana wins. Uh, who else am I mi missing out on? Who else am I missing out? Oh, you're going to know fighting uh, Libram on some sort of balancing rock. And Lucy is in the chase of her life against Virgo. To the point, yes, it gets to the point where it's very sexual and it's very fan service -y. And this is one of the one times where I don't like the fan service here. And one part of this little scuffle with Virgo, literally Virgo puts freaking Lucy in her bikini, forces her into her bikini, and then gets watermelon and puts and smashes the watermelon where you see the seed all seed, the watermelon seeds all over her and stuff like that. And in the meantime, you have Lucy like, stop this. You know, this is just, this is freaking, it's all wet. And then I'm all sticky. I'm like, we really have to be sexual right now. Sticky, wet, really? I thought we were already sexual with the levy type of things. So thinking about the fact that, well, guess what? Apparently she gets on herself or she turns herself on some sort of way. She does things to herself to think when she's thinking about Gajil. Well, here we go. Same thing here. Even Virgo strips down into a damn near skinless bikini because fan service and stuff like that. So why, 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 I ask. Also, if you, I don't care how you interpret this. Eventually, freaking Virgo gets mayo, like mayo bottle. And she's like, I'm going to spread this all over you. Now, listen. Mayo is clearly white. And if you know what type of stuff I'm talking about, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to say anything. But if you clearly, if you have a dirty mind, you know what the mayo is a reference to. I'm just going to say that. I'm going to leave it at that. That's fan service I don't like. I get what they did it. Uh oh, what would happen? Let's 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 see if we can get a little Lucy Mayo squirted on her to uh, kind of represent a uh, term when uh, you're doing the S word. Yeah, I saw that. Don't don't um, please a one picture, please. I think a lot of people know that type of reference. What you're trying to mean out there with the mayo, with the mayo, trying to use the mayo like that. So, whatever. Wendy and um, Natsu get to uh, Loki's, back to Loki's domain. They eventually get through a whole type of wall, and they end up freaking getting to a passway, um, and eventually they run to the third, 13th gate of the Zodiac Spirits, and that's Orphicus, or, or, I don't know, I'm just gonna, yeah, or, 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 or Fuchsius or something like that. Um, so, yeah. Um, they end up having a little... BS supposed to be comedic funny scene where she's torturing them or something like that, but it's not funny. It's just boring and annoying. Um, Loki events of reappearing, and then we find out it was kind of a trap set by them. Um, so Loki starts a ritual, um, and it starts to have an effect on the spirits in the constellation. They find out that well, they can still perform the ritual while the spirits' gates are closed in their constellations. So then what the hell was the point? You might as well should have just stopped them from the very beginning. So, yeah. Anyways, um, Orphicus, or, or, Orphicus shows up again, but this time she fuses with her snake form because she's a snake charmer. 
um, and everything. Um, and essentially, she also goes on to mention that they've been fighting inside her the entire time. So this is really her body. The astral spirit is her body. Um, so the thing is, um, Natsuki ends up fighting Loki. He ends up defeating Loki by eating his dark, his dark magic, which Natsu does over and over again. And well, he only does it two times in his arc, but he eats elements that he probably shouldn't be eating or whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, after that, it's looking like, um, the, the, uh, Librem globe is going to stop glowing, but it doesn't, uh, or Fy or, or Ficus starts chanting some stuff and everything. Um, he, he shows up and she says, uh, that it's in response to serving the celestial king, celestial spirit king. Natsu, apparently after eating the dark magic, also too, isn't feeling too well and everything, so... Yeah, we find, and then again, like uh, going back to the whole Celestial Spirit King, we find out he's the true mastermind in this whole thing. So great. It's the king that was the whole problem this entire time. Great. More drag out stuff. So Natsu just ends up br um, breaking the Eclipse Celestial Spirit's world because it's Natsu and he can do that. Um, and then because of it emerges, and Yukino and Lucy finish up their fights against Virgo and Librum. By using Aranometria. So, yeah. Um, again, so they stopped all the 12 spirits. But Arfaka says, oh, guess what? They're essentially fucked now because you just helped me out. You helped the king out. And I essentially said the Eclipse spirits were lied to and they were tricked um, into doing the plan that they wanted to do. Um, mostly because uh, they were afraid of the Eclipse Celestial Spirit King's power of how strong it was. That's why. And that's also why they were willing to die. Because they don't want to deal with him no more. Essentially, we also find out that if left unchecked, the Celestial Spirit King, the Eclipse version, can literally destroy the Celestial World. Now, Natsu starts to fight our, our um, 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 our, oh god, fucking snake charmer lady. Um, but she uses a flute called the Serpent's Dance of Death, which allows her to control any serp substance in her sight, essentially making Essentially, having Natsu hit himself. She has this whole thing where she can force Natsu back too, so whatever. Anyways, Earth and the others, they attack the snake body. Um, and Wendy and the others try to des destroy the globe. It doesn't work. He's weak for majority of this art, is blaming herself anyways, like she blames herself for the eclipse stuff. Whatever. Um, and thanks to Lucy and Yukino, they end up playing, saying like, hey, this isn't your fault, yada, yada, yada. They all end up together doing magic together to, to destroy the 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 Librum. Um, so that's what happens at the same time Natsu defeats um or 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 Fakus or Orpheus or whatever you want to call her. I don't know. It, it's hard. It's pronounced it's like it, it sounds like it's Orpheus, but whatever. But anyways, they defeat they defeat they defeat Snake Charmer Girl. Librum's done. Um and essentially the thing is they have to uh uh, eventually, Horologium shows up. One, after the after, uh, funny, funny thing, after the Yukino, um, Isui, and Lucy all did that spell, their clothes are essentially all ripped up to the point they're damn near half naked. Yeah. Okay. Unnecessary fan service we didn't need there. Now, this is the first fan service type of scene we've seen for Princess Isui. I'll take that because I think Isui's thick. Um, but listen. Was that needed? No, we don't. Anyways, Horlogium says that the Celestial Spirit World is still being affected by the Eclipse version of the King. They go into the freaking Celestial World. They see the creature he looks like. It's literally like a space monster-like creature with a thumb as a head. Um, essentially, he sucks in the Zodiac Spirits. He absorbs their power. He starts fighting. And eventually, when he starts fighting, he does this attack where he turns everybody into constellations. I'm shocked that they turned Wendy and Carl into a constellation before they turned Gajil. Gajil was actually pretty important in this fight. But we see Natsu go into the, the Eclipse Celestial Spirit King's um, mouth. Eventually, he has to fight off some things that treat him like he's a germ or something. They find the real Celestial Spirit King. He's chained to, I guess you could say, the core of the stomach slash it looks like a purple sun. Um, and the thing is... They try to break him out. It doesn't work. Eventually, what does Natsu do? Natsu, he ends up 
eating the fire uh, coming off this purple sun, and then he does freaking fire. It's still celestial spirit, you know, dragon mode, uh, freaking attack, and he frees the. Uh, he, he essentially frees the celestial spirit king on the outside. They eventually defeat. They, they eventually defeat the Eclipse version, and then the arc's all over. Everything goes back to normal. Celestial spirit, the Celestial world looks like it looked like back when we first came here, back in the grand, at the start of the Grand Magic Games arc. Um, Isui tries to apologize for what happened to uh, to the Celestial Spirit King, and she's like, it was my fault I caused this, you know, by opening the Eclipse Gate and everything, you know, it really freaking screwed all you guys up and messed you guys up. It's my fault. And the king's like, hey, it's no, hey, don't worry about it. It's no problem. You were helping out my friend. So you did a good thing. Listen, at the end of the day, it was all our faults. At, at, the, at the end of the day, it was all our faults. So is this trying to say some sort of type of thing telling me it was my fault to watch this arc again? Because that's what it seems like. It seems like I wasted my time watching this arc all over again. That's it. They go back to the regular world. They don't lose any time um, granted them because you would think that, hey, they were long. Um, they, they, I'm like, they, they, they were long in the Celestial Spirit world for a long time. They would probably get back and it would have been freaking in 10 years they would have been passed and they would have been gone. Nope, Celestial Spirit King was like, guess what? We can transport you back and no time is lost. Then why didn't they do that in the Grand Magic Games arc? Oh, wait, because of plot, and we want to make the stakes higher. It would have been, it would have made sense because they would have never achieved their second origin. But I'm just pointing that out, just the logic, just the logic. At least keep things consistent. So you're telling me the king could have sent them all back home, back in the Grand, Grand Magic Games arc at the start, at the time they first got there, which was three months before the Grand Magic Games arc. But here, oh yeah, we can uh, send you back to the time when you first got here. They get back home. They get back home. They enjoy their funny times. Stuff like that. This arc's done. Done, done, done. The rest of the episodes, filler. And honestly, I thought the, some of the filler episodes were even better. We get a freaking filler episode where it's the, the one episode where Natsu and Lucy... Thanks to Asuka, almost kiss because Asuka's like, hey, kiss her, Lucy, or, or kiss her, Natsu, because mommy and daddy kiss. It was a good episode because it goes to show you that Natsu, you know, when he eventually gets his kid with Lucy down the road, Nasha, yes, if you don't believe me, go read 100-year 100, 100 quest. They don't have a kid in that series. Their Edelus versions have a kid. I'm sorry for spoiling. I don't care. I'm done with this art. You see how pissed I am. Anyways, it goes to see you when when they finally, when Natsu and Lucy finally have their daughter, guess what? Natsu's going to turn out to be a great dad. He's going to make his daughter like him, in that, and guess what? Natsu's going to be a daddy's girl. So I love that. Also, I do like the fact that, well, when Asuka said, hey, Natsu, Lucy, kiss. Natsu was down to kiss Lucy. Again, like, uh, I think I said this before. I'll say it again. If I haven't Listen, my thing with Natsu is this. Uh, he's not the most oblivious slash dumb protagonist in terms of romantic, you know, characters. Because, one, he always tells Lucy to strip down when it comes to ideas to try to get out of a situation. Two, he's kind of not oblivious to the fact that he has feelings towards Lucy. He actually embraces those feelings. And he actually likes... And there's been countless times where he actually gets an enjoyment out of seeing Lucy naked. There's been evidence. And two, here, we can all see that Nazu has feelings for Lucy in a way where it's romantic. It's the fact that he was willing to make out with her just to please Asuka. He was willing to kiss her. Now, Lucy's still in the type of phase, even in modern day fairy tale right now with one of your quests where she's like, I don't want none of that. I don't want to express my feelings to Nazu, even though she likes him back clearly. Um, she's just not ready to take the relationship to the next level. Although Natsu, I feel like, wouldn't care if they took the relationship to the next level. He'd be like, fine, if you want to go out, go out. It's going to be weird, but listen, it's like he says at the end of the freaking 
uh, main series. He says to hit Lucy, we're always going to be together forever. So in that way, that's kind of an indirect way of them saying that they're going to eventually be hooked up in the future. It's just whenever Majima wa- finally wants to pull the trigger. So you get it. That was a pretty nice filler episode. Um, you get a nice, lovely filler episode between Gray and Juvia, where on the day of Orr's death, um, Gray's trying to mourn it, and Juvia wants to do something nice for him because she says it as, I guess, their anniversary day since they first met or something like that. Um, and she tries to give him a scar. And then Gray remembers from the past. Um, eventually, Gray turns that down and says he wants nothing to do with it. But Gray remembers from his past when Orr gave him a scarf. He finds a scarf and he actually wears it. I thought that was a sweet little moment to show that, well, Gray does have a heart for Juvia and he does care about Juvia. Also, I do like the fact how Urza just embraces this relationship. I really do love the fact that Urza embraces this relationship. Too also, also in that episode in that episode is when Juvia is going around asking other characters what would be a good present. She actually goes up to Evergreen, and Evergreen actually imagines her because Juvia is like, yeah, I want to give Gray a present so then we can end up getting married in the future. And Evergreen actually thinks about it, and she thinks about, well, guess what? What would happen if me and Elfman got married? And they said, oh, we would want to have a kid, um, and you have it to where, you know, Elf- Elfman's like, I want a little lady. And freaking El- Evergreen's like, you should have said man. Um, so one, we find out here that uh, Evergreen is definitely in love with Elfman and she wants to get married by him, which I forgot to mention the Grand Magic Games are. There are worse shipping moments. Um, other than fillery moments, there, uh, there, there are shipping moments between Elfgreen, uh, Elfman and Evergreen um, in the Grand Magic Games arc. Um, so I find that funny. And then when freaking Juvia goes to ask Elfman what he wants, freaking Elfman's like, I would want a man. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> funny. Um, so yeah, um, that whole thing was nice. I guess another point out episode where I got a lot of laughs was the fact that um, Nasu and Lucy try to learn from Mirajin how to do takeover magic. And Wakaba and Makao try to learn takeover magic um, from the standpoint of they want to impress their former wives or their ex-wives, but it, it was funny. Well, the fun thing about the funny thing about freaking uh, th- this episode was we got to see what Lucy looks like in Natsu's gear, which is hilarious because Lucy's like, get away from that and turn off. Because, hey, if you show damn near anything when it comes to Lucy's own cleavage, she doesn't like it, <laughs> which is funny. Um, and then we see freaking Gajil, Lily, and fucking Urza all act like fucking superheroes. And then at the end of the episode, you have freaking Urza looking like she's straight out of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure with her face, or she looks like she's straight coming out sort of like a serious comic book. Hilarious. I didn't get to the end of the other filler episodes. Um, but uh, yeah. So the Eclipse Lesson Spirits are. Did I love it? Did I enjoy it? Hell no. I found it boring, repetitive, and stupid. Cool premise. Some pretty cool moments or funny moments. But other than that, don't care. Don't want it to see it again. And that's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. I don't want to talk about this arc no more. I don't. I just found myself bored watching this. Bored. The same exact way I felt first watching this, same exact way I feel now. Bored. The only thing I like about it is the opening songs, Mysterious and Magic, and the other one, pretty catchy, pretty catchy. Other than that, nope, don't care. Don't want to read, don't want to do this. So please do yourself a favor. Skip this arc if you're watching the anime and don't watch it ever again because you're going to get yourself boring. But if you want to watch it all together, go ahead. Go waste a few episodes watching a boring arc. Anyways, let's move on to bigger and better things. So, in this case, we're almost damn near done with this entire ARC review series, but we're still got a lot more videos left to go. So, next Monday, on the premiere video of uh, Fairy Tale ARC Reviews, Cam Free 15's Fairy Tale ARC Reviews, I'm going to uh, be talking about the, inch, the soft little intro into the Tartarus ARC. 
and that is the uh, Sun Village arc. Um, so yeah, next week we'll talk about Sun Village, and then we'll talk about Tartarus after that. So look forward to the Sun Village arc because that is the soft intro to the Tartarus arc. Anyways, I'm gonna get out of here, guys. If you guys like the video, leave a like. Put in the comment section your thoughts on the Eclipse Lesser Spirit arc. Do you like it? Do you hate it? Anything else? Any other funny moments you want to point out? Don't care. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to get more fairy tale arc review content. And uh, when you do hit that subscribe button, make sure you hit that notification bell icon so you're up to date with whatever I upload to the channel. Other than that, um, I'm going to get out of here. So hopefully you guys enjoy the rest of your day or not to this video. Um, and uh, yeah, till then, guys, I'll see you guys next Monday for the Sun Village arc review. Till then, guys, peace. Thank you.